I'm going to start this a little early tonight just because I can. And maybe also because last week I cut it a little too close. Um, because last week I was talking to my friend Foster until about 20 minutes before the program, before this show. And then I had to shave, get a shower and everything before 9 o'clock. little too rushed. So I had more than enough time to get everything done and... Uh, and I've actually been sitting here for about 20 minutes. So I thought, Hey, we're a little early, a couple minutes early. There weren't too many people in here yet. So I thought, well, let's just get this done and turn this camera on and get started. Um, it's April 15th, 2020. And if it wasn't for everything else that was going on in the world right now, this would be tax day. Instead, of a lot of people having the deadline to file their taxes, a lot of people are getting money back as part of this stimulus stuff that's going on. Hello, Christine. Happy Wednesday night to you, too. And a little bit. What's going on? Hi to you. Hope you're well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if uh, I'm not on the stimulus check list uh, for a variety of reasons. But for those of you, I've seen some people posting about how uh, they've gotten theirs. I don't know uh, how they're sending them out all at one time, or maybe they're going by social security numbers. I know that happens, uh, maybe an order of social security number or something like that. But um, so if you're getting, like, what is it, $1,200 per person or something, if you're getting that, uh, good for you. And I hope you spend it or save it or do whatever with it uh, wisely. However, I know for many of you who have lost your jobs, been laid off, furloughed, whatever the words they're using, I, I'm guessing the $1,200 uh, doesn't go as far as you'd like. Jasmine, Anne, Concha, Savannah. Hello, Savannah. That's a great name. I think they're going by banks. Is that right, Savannah? Okay. Okay, Savannah. Hello, Angela. Good to see you. Um, as for me, uh, today, busy day today. Uh, completed most of Friday's episode. Uh, I wrote the, um, the uh, everything that I'll be talking, I guess you'd call it the script, for Friday's episode. I recorded it. And then I listened to the interview, and it sounds great. I think the audio is fantastic. Had to cut a, a couple parts out in there where both my guest and myself made a, a few mistakes. But uh, this episode for this Friday, of course, we'll talk about it before we're done tonight, uh, is going to be easily over two hours long. So I did those things today, and then I had to put it a little – itinerary for tonight's live show, as I always have. If you're ever wondering why I'm always looking over this way uh, during these live shows, it's because I do this show on my Dell laptop, which I've had since August 2017. And then the notes are on the screen on my MacBook off to the left. And that's also the computer I do all of the Unfound episodes on where I edit the interviews and record everything on that computer. So there you go. Um, Kristen, hey, if you are taking questions, I know you said you once were going to do the Brandon Lawson case. Just wondering what happened and why you didn't end up doing it. Crawl Space interviewed. Uh, I can answer that, Kristen, in a moment. The Dope Patrol, mine was direct deposit. I found my taxes that way. Cool. Hello, Kathy. Um, uh, Kristen, they were, but I will get into that in a moment. Hey, Sheree, what's going on? I was just talking to Sheree uh, a little bit before this show started, and she uh, let me know of something that went on today that I didn't know about that I will be talking about eventually. Um, Savannah says, oh, Savannah, you're making my day. In another true crime podcast group I'm in on Facebook, they have a thread going about unfound and how great I am. Well, how great I'm, I'm saying how great the program is. Well, um, that's fantastic. Uh, there's nothing like good word of mouth. That's uh, a lot better than any paid advertising or anything that any, and that's for any product or service anywhere. 
So uh, I'm guessing that had to have been done uh, grassroots, Savannah, because I don't, I know that I did not start that discussion, whatever, whatever it is. And I don't think any of my assistants did. If they did, they didn't tell me about it. So uh, that's fantastic, Savannah. Um, what maybe you uh, should just tell us right now, uh, what group is that? A little bit. When did you all start Super Chat? Well, uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> That's funny. Susan, a um, little bit says, mine came on H&R Block Card. Okay, people getting them different ways. Uh, yeah, Sherry, first time live with Super Chat. Uh, I can answer, Kristen, I can answer your question uh, right now about Brandon Lawson. I, here's what I will tell you, and I'm going to speak both for myself and my assistant, Emily, who is in charge of those things. Um, we have shown an interest. At one, uh, we showed an interest. It wasn't this year. I'm going to say sometime last year in 2019, maybe a year ago, maybe a little less than that. But I'm thinking it was 2019 about covering the case. Um the way my memory is, what my memory is telling me is that Emily did speak to one of those people uh, that you mentioned, Kristen, either um, Cal or Ladessa, the way I remember it. And things just kind of, I, I don't know if they stopped responding to Emily or what. Um, but I never did end up speaking because um, we just have a a way of doing things here where for the most part, Emily is the one that contacts people first. And then when she gets the information, we talk things over. She sends me like a little paragraph uh, of what the person's already told her already. So I can kind of start running things through my mind. So I don't go into uh, the first conversation cold. Just never got to the point where I, I spoke to anybody. I think Emily did. I'm, I'm not sure it was on the phone or not, but just these things happen. I'm not criticizing them. Take in no way am I criticizing them. I don't know. Um, and I think the other thing, Kristen, probably is because, as everybody realizes, uh, that case has gotten a lot of attention. And uh, as I continue to say, those, any attention that I would give to a missing persons case that's gotten a lot of attention would take away from one that hasn't. And um, we just don't pursue those really well-known disappearances very energetically. It's not that we won't do them. It's just that... Um, we definitely keep our eye on covering a lot of disappearances that have maybe gotten no attention or only one article or two articles are written about them instead of other podcasts already covering it multiple times or being on some national show or something like that. Um, so it was probably a combo of things that Emily contacted them and then something broke down there. I'm not blaming Emmy. I'm Emily. I'm not blaming them. And then it was just like, we know we got all these other disappearances over there, over here, which aren't as well known. These pet people, you know, are really willing and able and everything else. And we're just going to go with them. Um, but I'm certainly open to, and I'm sure Emily is open to talking to anybody in Brandon's family. Um, Maybe we can make that happen in 2020. I, I just don't know. Um, but it's not because they're biased. Um, you know, I think the way we do things on Unfound is, I mean, we interview mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. I guess you could say in their own way they're biased. Um, but that, uh, to my knowledge, that was not – uh, not something that popped up at all. I don't, I don't, not sure what you mean by biased anyway, but just because they might give to one side of a view, well, we kind of do that anyway on Unfound, although we do try to get the other side and we, I think we try to represent these disappearances fairly. Um, although I continue to say we can't help it if certain facts make certain people look bad, we can't do anything about that. 
but it would it would not be because uh, of any bias that that just doesn't even occur to me regarding Brandon Lawson's case. I hope that answers your question, uh, Kristen. Um, hello, Michelle. Um, the Mao Hire Podcast Group. I can't say I've ever even heard of it. So that's interesting, Savannah. Okay. Mm, Cherie is now telling me. Okay, Cherie. So Cherie, maybe instead of Emily, it was you, Cherie. I'm sorry that if I got I got that wrong. Um, Cherie, if you will notice, Kristen, uh, down here, Cherie in blue, one of my assistants, the the woman with the wrench beside her name. Uh, she's saying she talked to Ladessa. She didn't want to talk about things Brandon was involved with. So maybe that, maybe, uh, maybe that's what I, Sheree, I have to admit, honestly, I don't remember that. I'm sure you're telling the truth. Uh, I just don't remember that. But, uh, then that, uh, then if the, Sheree, if that's true, then I would agree that, um, yes, that probably would put a little damper on us covering the case of, they want to stay away from, from some things that might have led to Brandon's disappearance. That would certainly be a factor, Kristen, certainly. Uh, thank you for thank you for putting that in there, Sheree. I just don't remember that, but okay. Um, Kathy, a little bit. There's YouTube. Uh, uh, did a show and used Unfound Podcast for reference. There is a YouTube who did a show and used Unfound Podcast for reference. I'd like to know more about that a little bit. Uh, the Dope Patrol, Sheree, of course she didn't because he was on meth at the time and those were not gunshots. It was cars going by on a bridge. They played me and other friends like a fiddle. It was big trouble. I think they would need to tell the truth this time around. That would be good. Okay, so obviously there's some people in here. and So I know Brandon's lost his disappearance. I know about the 911 call, but I am not an expert on it. Um, so obviously some people here. Sheree, maybe you want to continue to talk to the Doe Patrol a little bit about that, uh, I, and that's fine as this uh, show continues. So, but uh, I will just tell you, in generally, whether it's Brandon Loss's disappearance or any other one, um, if people are going to want to be on the program, then they need to be honest about who the missing person was or is. Um, that is that it, you have to, we have to do things that way. That's the only thing that's that uh, that is a, that was one of the hardcore points uh, about this program. That we're we're not going to shy away from those imperfections that a missing person has, uh, simply to make that missing person look good. That's not why we're doing. We don't do this program to make people look good. We do this program to inform to move cases ahead and try to put these cases in a situation where they can be solved. The only way you can do that is being transparent and honest. The only way. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Paula. For everybody watching right now, you see the thumbs up. The, please like this video, video as you're watching it. If you are not subscribed to the Unfound Podcast channel, uh, please do that as you're watching tonight. We're going to be here a while, I think, so you've got some time. But please like this video. It certainly helps in the algorithms for all of, uh, not just this video, but all the other videos that we've we've done. It helps them get more exposure. Um, Cherie says, uh, how can you find the truth if you can't talk about it? That's right. That's right. That's why... Um, this is why we um, we have to talk about these people and that that the people, the guests who are going to be on the program know. And that's why we've had parents talk about their children's drug addictions and uh, other things that were going on in their lives, had felony records, been in jail, because these are things that could lead uh, to new information regarding their disappearance. That's why we do it. We talk about problems and marriages and relationships and abuse and, and everything else because we know all of it, each one of those points um, can lead to a disappearance. We don't want to just talk about how uh, somebody made the honor roll and got employee of the month. 
So, uh, Kristen, thank you for that. Uh, like I said, it seems Cherie has a better memory uh, of that. I thought it was Emily who was talking to them. I guess not. It was Cherie. Okay. And uh, Cherie seems to remember it uh, a lot better than I do. Thank you, Cherie. Um, so, you know what I've been doing? Uh, this has been like Groundhog Day for me. I've actually been listening to uh, some disco over the last few days. Uh, one of my... Uh, close friends, very special friend of mine from Las Vegas. Her name is April, uh, had a, uh, Instagram post, uh, video with, um, Donna Summers, love to love you, baby. In the background. And I was like, man, I have not listened to some disco in a while. So I've been listening to some disco. I know I'm a heavy, heavy, heavy metal guy. got the long hair and all that. And I am, that is number one, but I like disco music too. So I've been listening to that uh, over the last couple of days, just chilling here, uh, up here on the eighth floor. Uh, that's, you know, that's what's been going on. Just been busy today. I'm not sure what I have planned for tomorrow, though. I do have to make a call tomorrow. And thank you, Cherie. Oh, boy. There you go. Thanks, Cherie. That's how you super chat, everybody. Uh, doing it right there because now that the YouTube channel is monetized, in fact, I should probably talk about that right now. I've gotten several, uh, questions over the last year or so as more and more videos have been put on YouTube. Why isn't it monetized? Why is it? Why is it? Why is it? Are, are you, is it monetized? Are you doing this? You're doing that. And even though um, there were many videos on there that until, of course, the beginning of this year, I had posted my, myself. And the main reason is because a lot of those uh, pretty much the first year and four months of the program, I was using um, copywritten music for the intro and outro of the program. Maybe some of you don't even um, know that. But when I started the program, I didn't go and get, what do they call that? Free access music or whatever it's called. Uh, I actually was using the intro to an Iron Maiden song called the great unknown. And because of that, when it came to YouTube, they allowed me to, um, use it on YouTube. It's just, if you use anything copywritten, then you can't monetize your channel. All my videos had that copywritten music in there. Well, when I started working with the Trib in beginning of 2018, one of the things I had to do, because I didn't want to get into a copywritten copyright problem, especially with them involved for that year, was I got new music, the music that you now hear for the intro and outro for the program that I can use for anything that I want. I got it from, what is it called? Cloud five or pond five is the name of the website. That's where I got the music. And so that's what I use to this day, but I never had a chance to go back and change the music to all of those videos on there. Just, it's a lot of work. Well, when Natasha came along uh, and came on and started uh, working with the program. Uh, that's one of the jobs she took on. And so now she has changed enough of the music on enough of those videos that we uh, can now monetize uh, the channel. Of course, that the music was the only thing holding back because everything else is original material. You know, I'm not reading word for word off of Wikipedia or even, even though I mentioned the Charlie Project, I don't read directly off of it. I mention it. Everything that you hear on the program is original material. So the actual program itself, there was no problem. It was just the music. And now that's been fixed. And now we are in a position to uh, monetize the channel. Now, you should, you probably maybe notice if you can see the views. You know, you know, we don't get a lot of views uh, on YouTube, but some, a couple of the videos on there are very, very popular. Flight 370 
is number one, the interview I did with Jeff Wise, and then Tom Brown's episode and the videos that go along with it, uh, the accompanying uh, security video have been very popular as well. So, but now that it's monetized, it's going to be, uh, you're going to probably notice we're going to be mentioning it uh, more and more and more. And that was my original vi uh, vision when I started this show way back in 2017, uh, doing this on Wednesday nights. I think we started on Tuesday nights and moved it to Wednesdays. Um, so now everything is kind of coming together for the channel on YouTube, and it's very exciting. Natasha's doing a great job with it, doing a great job with the website too. That is, Those are certainly things she is uh, very, very good at. Um, and I would admit, I kind of understood the YouTube part of it uh, when I was doing it on my own, but the website, the old website, um, was, uh, you know, uh, something that I couldn't talk about for a while, but now I can. It's theunfoundpodcast.com, and I'm very, very proud of that. But keep in mind, I don't have anything to do with the website. Uh, Natasha and I talk about it. We do. I do the program. I do the interviews and everything, and, and then she takes these things that we're generating, the blog and the Patreon, Instagram, and, and taking it and doing what she can with the website. So, um, and she knows what she's doing and I'm perfectly happy, uh, allowing, uh, her to do it and just with some tips from me and she just goes and does it and that's fine with me. But, um, so what you're seeing here is yes, the super chat is new. Um, I'm not going to probably talk about it. Uh, Sheree obviously knows something about it and I've watched other, um, YouTube channels that I watch live streams where people are super chatting, you know, donating, do, donating money, hitting the, the money button, everything else. Uh, and that's great. That's great. But before I really, really start uh, mentioning it and, and what we can do with that, I'm probably not going to mention it too much at this second. I'm just happy to be at the point right now on April 15th, 2020, that the channel can now be monetized. It's all legal. And now, you know, we can just go from there and figure out what we're going, you know, to do uh, with it. So, um, so yes, this is something new. If you're noticing that, who, who was it? Little bit, um, notice that then yes. First lie. Yeah. A little bit noticed it. Yeah. This is the first show, uh, this happened. We just got monetization, monetization, this, the end of last week or this weekend that uh, I was made aware of it. So it's just something new, something new happening here all the time. Uh, Christine says, not much into disco, maybe Casey in the Sunshine Band. Well, that's certainly disco, Christine. So that's cool. Uh, the Dope Patrol says, I have the CD, the best of Donna Summer, no shame here. And I'm gothic alternative. Okay. Donna Summer. Okay. A little bit on country, but love all music. Can't do country music a little bit. Uh, Christine says, I have a lot of, uh, Unfound has a lot of subscribers. Uh, we're just going to have to work on it. Christine, I think that uh, that number needs to go up given the popularity of the podcast. But given that we are one of the very, very few podcasts that takes audio and converts it into video, uh, probably that's that the, the number of subscribers that we have is probably pretty good given that we are not technically a YouTube based program. So, uh, zebra, what's going on? Um, uh, because he was cute. Casey was cute. Okay. Christine, uh, zebra, no country, but a lot of pop and rock for sure. Okay. Zebra. I was just mentioning how I was listening to disco. Once again, for anybody that's just tuned in, please do not forget to hit the like button for this live show as you're watching it you see the little i see it right up here the little it tells me right there how many of you have uh, given the video the thumbs up so if you're on your ipad your phone your laptop uh, please do that and uh, that would certainly help us out the christy nichols poll the most popular pick 
uh, for the poll that was in the Unfound podcast discussion group, uh, uh, came out Saturday morning till today, was that the most popular choice was that Christy actually wrote the letter that was found under the seat of her car, but she was holding it for some point in the future, and it was meant for somebody else. It wasn't meant for her husband, Mark. Now, what's interesting is that in the think tank that we did on Sunday night, and I should mention that, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. If you'd like to become a member of the think tank, we actually um, have had two new subscribers to Patreon who are now eligible for the think tank, and I'm excited about that. But once again, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. Um, the think tank kind of agreed for once with the poll in the group. I think we had a few weeks in a row where the poll in the group was a different choice than what we decided in the think tank. And that happens. I, it just seemed like there was several weeks in a row where that happened. That's the way I remember it. Uh, however, I should tell you, I tend to believe that um, – even though a lot, despite the poll in the group and despite what the think a majority of the think tank thought, I have to say that I'm still leaning toward the idea that the letter was forged by Mark. Just you know, my opinion. Uh, you know, we still don't maybe understand why it was under under, under the driver's seat. Um, maybe he put it there after finding it. Maybe she put it there to hide it from him if she wrote it. Uh, and you know, the big problem is nobody's seen this letter. It exists. I'm guessing it's in the Gothenburg police department or maybe the Nevada state police or Nebraska state police, uh, office somewhere, but it would be nice if Christie's family got to see it after all these years. And that would certainly, I think, clear up some things and it would certainly clear up if it was forged or not. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, right now, Sheree is posting patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. Uh, Note.com on the end there, Sheree. And uh, for the Facebook or Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash unfound podcast. So uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you for all the thumbs up. Thank you, uh, everyone. So that was uh, the way the poll went. I have to admit I'm a little surprised by both what the think tank decided and what the people in the group decided, I thought that the most popular pick would be that the letter uh, was forged. Maybe because that's what I was thinking myself, and maybe I'm a little biased. That could be. Um, it, but it really surprised me that uh, so many people would think that she actually wrote it at some point right? You know, before her disappearance. It seems like some coincidental time. Timing there. Okay. Let's move on uh, to this. Speaking of Christy Nichols, uh, it didn't even occur to me until after the episode played that we've now covered three disappearances where the person's last name is Nichols. Now, Nichols is surely not an unusual last name in the United States. Uh, it's somewhat common. Uh, it's surely more common than Denzel, D, my last name. In fact, you know, my name is Ed Denzel. My father's name is Edward Denzel, but I'm not a junior. He has a middle name. I have no middle name because I'm weird like that. But he and I are the only two Ed Denzels on the earth, period. So over 7 billion people, one Ed Denzel, and my dad's the other Ed Denzel. Well, we know that the last name Nichols is, you know, fairly common, not in the top 10, but we've already covered three disappearances where uh, that the people had that last name. And what three are they? Of course, Christy. Uh, Trevor Nichols, going back to August of 2019, uh, had his mother on, uh, Aaron. Uh, he disappeared from New York. You'll remember he was. Uh, allegedly got on a train and disappeared. And then going way back to the beginning of 2017 in Unfound's infancy, maybe about the 10th disappearance, 
We covered on Unfound. We had Jeff Nichols, who disappeared from Salt Lake City, Utah. And that uh, the circumstances of that disappearance was that he was going to meet his ex-wife because she was going to give him some free golf clubs, and he allegedly didn't show up. And then his pickup was found a couple days later. And right after then, uh, she and her parents and her son, also Jeff's son, fled to the country of Ireland where they live to this day. That's Jeff Nichols. Uh, so we've had three of the last name Nichols. What got me thinking, let's take a look at other last names just, just to see. And we're gonna, I'm going to go through some st other statistics for Unfound before this uh, show is over uh, tonight. Yeah, uh, I have two other Michelle Coles in my town, one married to my cousin. Yes, it gets confusing. Well, Cole is another common last name, Michelle, and Michelle, uh, maybe not as much now, but I know when I was in high school, Michelle was a very popular name. Michelle seemed to be a very popular name in the 1980s. I can think of like three or four Michelles in my class or one year this way, one year that way, just off the top of my head. So I, I can't say that I'm, I guess I'm surprised by that, Michelle. Um, but do you realize, just going through some last names, and I went through the top um, last most popular last names in the United States. We have covered no disappearances with the last name Smith. None. We've covered two disappearances with the last name Brown, of course, Tom Brown, and then also Devin Brown Busetta. Busetta was her married name, but she went by Brown Busetta. So we have two with la that last name. We've only covered one disappearance with the last name Johnson. That was Tiffany Johnson, uh, just once again from later last year. We've covered one disappearance with the last name Williams. Brandon Williams. Uh, from we, that's another one going way back to 2017. His uh, sister Stormy uh, was the guest, and he disappeared while on a Greyhound bus from Salt Lake City to Key West, Florida. Uh, that's the only Williams that uh, we've covered. And then we've had two Millers, which is another popular last name in the United States in the top 10 of most popular last names. Jackson Miller from just a couple months ago from San Francisco, and then Molly Miller and, of course, Colt Haynes in the same episode. Once again, from uh, earlier, uh, I, I guess last year, sometime last year, maybe the middle, maybe in the summer of last year. So we've only had two Millers. We've had zero Davises, D-A-V-I-S, although... We had James Davis Walker, but I think Davis is his middle name. We've had zero Garcias, which is in the top 10 in the United States, zero Rodriguez's, and zero Wilson's. And those are the top. Uh, if you want to know, it's it goes uh, Smith, Brown, Johnson, Williams, Miller, Davis, Garcia, Rodriguez, Wilson are the top 10 most common last names in the United States. And and Jones in there too. And we've done very few of those. Very, very few. The statistics would say we should have covered uh, probably more of those. Why that is, I don't know. But on the other hand, and we've covered three disappearances with the last name Nichols. And I didn't realize it, like I said, until the, the episode came out uh, last Friday. Uh, the Doe Patrol, there's an Australian swimmer with my same name, spelled the same others I've seen by marriage. Paula Nichols is 173 on the list of names. If you count all the variations of spelling, it's 882. Yeah. Christine says, before I was adopted, my last name was Smith. That's interesting. Christine, you should know before, I didn't know you were adopted. That's interesting to me, Christine. Before I was adopted, my last name was Joyce, J-O-Y-C-E, of course, Irish, and, you know, a more common name in the United States, surely the Denzel. Um, Michelle said, and it was unusual when my parents decided my first name. My first sister's name was Natalia. They were trying to make us unusual. Yeah, Michelle did not end up being unusual at all, uh, Michelle. Um, 
Uh, Doe Patrol, I'm not going to say your last name on here. Not very common and your first name. Okay. Yeah. So it just occurred to me that, uh, man, that is weird. Uh, that uh, some of these most popular last names, we've not covered any people with those last names yet. So there's that. Also wanted to mention something else, and I think that I messed – I don't know if I said this last week or something and I feel bad about it, but I think when I talked about Nebraska disappearances, I don't know if it was in the think tank or maybe last week's show or at some point, uh, I had only mentioned Christie's case, Regina Marie Boss, and Jason Jolskowski. I, I, I forgot that there's another one that we've covered in Nebraska, Kamisha Hollis, and I feel bad that uh, I forgot that one. She disappeared from Omaha, Nebraska. That's another case that we uh, featured disappearance. We featured back in 2019. So those are the Nebraska disappearances. And once again, I think that's weird that we've covered four in Nebraska when Nebraska is not one of your more populated States. And I think just off the top of my head that we've covered as many disappearances in Nebraska as maybe we've, covered in New York. And I, you know, I'm thinking, of course, Trevor Nichols, Suzanne Lau, maybe there's, I think we've covered more in Nebraska than we have in New York. And New York has way more, a larger population than Nebraska. I don't know why that is. Uh, of course we did do, uh, we did cover uh, another New York case. So I guess we have three. Um, we had the one recently with Cassie Ramirez but uh, it's funny that we have it seemingly about the same from Nebraska as we do from New York. And we still have, we have still have states where we have not covered any disappearances yet in those states. So uh, it'll be noteworthy when we get to cover all 50 states. That, that will uh, certainly be interesting to me. It's probably going to take a while. Um, T-shirts. Let's talk about that. Um, I'm wearing one of the new t-shirts. Uh, this is one that was made by my assistant, Heather. Probably, it's hard to tell in here, but the front is a little bit different. Uh, even though it's the Unfound logo, it's more of a square, which I think we're going to work on that a little bit, maybe get that switched up a little bit. But the back is surely different than the other shirts uh, that I made um, that, that guests have gotten. You can see the back, maybe you can see it right here. That's what the back looks like. Little more, um, little more, uh, I guess, uh, fashionable is the word. And maybe it's a little easier to read with the lettering on the bottom. And I, I actually put this picture in the group and on the unfound page. Uh, if you didn't get a good look at it when I turned around, but, uh, from now on, uh, Heather is going to be making the t-shirts for the program. The only thing we have to get sorted out now is how to make Shopify work with the store that already exists. Uh, and we're going to have to work on that. But Heather, uh, you've probably seen her in the group. I'm not going to say her last name, but um, she's one of the administrators also uh, in, in the group along with Carrie. And, but she also does, has a business where she makes signs and, and things like that. And she actually made the sign, Heather made that. So she's very uh, artsy and uh, we're going to put the t-shirt stuff in her hands and anything else that she wants to cook up as far as merchandise. And I think once again, much like the YouTube uh, channel that you're on right now, I think moving it in that direction uh, with Heather, I think is going to be very positive compared to what's been going on uh, so far. Once again, one of these things that I was doing myself and I would do it when I would get the time. And now uh, I'm hoping that we can start to branch out uh, a little bit more with unfound merchandise, uh, not just for the listeners, but also uh, for the guests who appear on the program. So we'll see what goes on there? Um, Christine, uh, Paula, are they are they the super soft tees? Uh, Paula, I'm going to answer yes. <laughs> I don't know. I think they are. Um, I'm not. I, I guess that must be some terminology 
Uh, it seems soft to me. It's definitely a different material than the material for the other shirts that were getting made to this point, although they were, I think, good, very high quality. I know I have several of them. They've been washed several times, and they still look great. So those ones were high quality. I'm thinking this one is high quality. And now Sheree is saying, yes, Paula, they are super soft tees. Yes. Angela, well, just give us some time, Angela. We're still kind of sorting these things out. But uh, changes are coming. They are in the process of happening. Uh, the Doe Patrol, there are 11 missing persons right now in our national database with the last name Nichols. And, and we've covered three of them. Wow. Okay. Hmm. Um, Sheree says, I got the long sleeve and it was very comfortable. You're welcome, Paula. Yeah, we have to get that online. I'm going to have to work with Heather and make that a priority um, to get that done because the, the store is already set up. How do we connect the store to Heather? I know she's on Shopify. We're just going to have to make that happen some. So that's on the list of things to do. So this is... Like I said, new shirts, maybe some other new things coming down the line. Um, being that I just mentioned Jeff Nichols, uh, maybe almost coincidentally, Jeff Nichols' disappearance, we covered it. it was the first disappearance we covered at, at the beginning of 2017. Seems like yesterday, over three years ago. I don't know where the time's gone. But um, there's going to be seemingly a new search done. For him, uh, somebody in the group, I'm not, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. This was posted in the group that there's going to be a new search done sometime in the future around the Salt Lake City area for his remains. Of course, the most popular theory regarding his disappearance is that he got lured to meet his ex wife and then her father killed Jeff, and then they all took off and went to England. That is the working theory. Um, you know, the problem is Jeff could be anywhere, but um, there's going to be some new searches done. And what this person was saying is that they're going to be in areas where uh, Jeff's uh, ex-wife's family, would, you know, where they lived, where they hung out, where they, you know, people maybe who knew them, knew if they went to different areas. Seems as good a plan as any uh, at this point. Um, you know, the problem is Jeff could be anywhere because what happened was after he disappeared, the family drove to Arizona and then they went to Ireland. So if they had Jeff's remains with him, you know, with them, he could have been put anywhere between Utah and Arizona, anywhere. So it's a tough one. It's very, uh, very, very uh, difficult. Uh, Zebra, um, we're going to make that happen. Um, just have to give us a little time. Uh, time, is, we're going to take our time with this. I'm glad people are interested. That's very, that's great. That's great to hear. Thank you. Um, but we just uh, don't have it all quite set up yet. In fact, uh, Heather sent me and the, all the other assistance shirts um just to see how they look how they feel everything and they are really really good they're really really good uh and so this was kind of a test run for her to do and it's worked out uh very very well so now it's a matter of putting a mechanism in place where people can actually go online order them and they get made that doesn't quite exist right yet she can make shirts and she's going to be making shirts for the guests who haven't gotten them yet but as far as ordering and money and all those things, we don't have that set up yet, but it's going to happen. Um, so Jeff Nichols, it's good to hear, you know, so I suppose I'll be talking about that next week for the update episode. But it's good to hear uh, something going on with his disappearance because not much has been going on. That's my impression. Not, I know that uh, his sister, who was the guest way back then, did an interview sometime last year. Uh, I was happy to put that together for her. Uh, a reporter in Salt Lake City was looking for her, couldn't find her. Of course, I had her phone number, so I'm, I was glad I could facilitate that. 
Um, but other than that, not much is going on. So it's good to hear that um, some people out there are, are keeping Jeff in mind and they're going to do something about, you know, finding him, his remains or, you know, or whatever else uh, they may find. Um, Karen asks me, do you think that high profile cases like Mar Murray, Jennifer Kessie, et cetera, can bring more interest to the lesser known cases like the one on found covers? You know, Karen, uh, I'm dubious of that. I'm dubious of that um, because my impression of those disappearances, Karen, is that, um, of course, everybody in the true crime community, people who take an interest in missing persons cases, unsolved murders, uh, serial killers, I mean, they already know all about Mara Murray and Jennifer Kessie at least in the United States. I don't want to include everybody in other countries, but in the United States, I think most people who listen to podcasts, watch disappeared, uh, Nancy Grace or whatever else are into, um, know about Mara Murray and Jennifer Kessie. Um, the issue is the, just the general public, those people who don't listen to true crime podcasts or anything, they may hear something about Mara Murray or see an interview Jennifer Kessie's parents has done, have done with someone and not extrapolate that out to all of these other missing persons cases that don't get as much attention. I, I just don't, maybe I'm just cynical, but I, I don't think that's exactly how it works. In, in fact, that's the reason we don't handle that. We don't, it, we adhere to unfounded. We don't believe that covering a high-profile disappearance, it's going to bring more attention to the program other, overall, and then other people will maybe, they'll see these other disappearances, maybe. But I think, I, I just, I, I'm just very cynical about that. I don't think that um, people get interested in the, in disappearances because of a couple high profile cases. I think it has to be more, you know, something that's, that's in you. Um, and this is why we try to do these disappearances, uh, a kind of a, a different way, um, uh, because we realize that a lot of these disappearances, you know, may not get a lot of other coverage and that is not, um, any fault of the family or the police department or it's I I'm still, you know, I've been doing this for three and a half years. I'm still, still not sure what the formula is. I don't know why Brandon Lawson's disappearance is better known than 99.999 other missing persons, missing men's cases in the United States. Is it because of the 911 call? Maybe. I don't know. Why is Jennifer Kessie's maybe because of that video and, and, you know, how that person, the camera just happens to not catch that person's face behind the bars in that fence. Maybe. Mara Murray. I don't know. Maybe it was because, you know, she was uh, uh, a good girl who seemed to be uh, certainly suddenly get off on the wrong track using another credit card and all these things. Maybe that's what uh, – caught people's attention. Maybe it's because of the way she looked. I think we might have to include that in Jennifer Kessie's disappearance as well. Um, why is Brian Schaefer's disappearance so well known? Is it because of the video? Is it, you know, all these rumors that he actually did leave his life? I don't know. You know, what I do know is we've covered disappearances on Unfound with video, and I'm not just me me meaning Tom Brown's, but other ones, and they, they're still not as popular as those. So I don't know. I don't know what the right mixture is. It's, um, you know, I think we're still trying to find that res recipe. So um, I just don't, I don't think it re generally works that way that somebody finds out about Mara Murray for the first time and then suddenly becomes, you know, so engr engrossed and, you know, learning about disappearances and, and, and all of that. I I'm just not sure that's the way it works. Um, Instead, I think, you know, what I believe is that each disappearance has its own importance. And that's the way you treat it. 
Um, the G's poor Jeff so messed up. God in the car and ugly like a movie. With, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. The patrol. Uh, it's just. Uh, I, I'm not saying that happened, but I also know where that family went after Jeff disappeared, and that's why I'm saying that. Um. Michelle says, or it just is it just nothing but timing? I believe looks and timing is the key personally. No, no. Um, timing certainly has something to do with it. Uh, you know, Brian, uh, Brandon Lawson, if looks do, uh, is he a good looking guy? I don't know. Maybe some people may find him attractive. I don't know. But. Uh, I, I don't know if looks has anything to do. I don't know if looks has anything to do with Brian Schaefer's, but I'm a guy, I'm a straight guy. I'm attracted to women, women. So maybe it's a little harder for me to, to say that. I don't know. But, um, it's just, it's just, it is certainly timing. It's something, it's certainly something, but just have not put, a finger on it yet, even after all of the disappearances that we've covered. You know, I guess we did cover a, a popular one in Jesse Ross's disappearance. That's a fairly well-known one. Not like Brian Schaefer, Brandon Lawson, or Jennifer Cassie Marmory, some of these others. But it's it's certainly up there, and it's mainly because I think his family has uh, kept it out there. I think that Jesse makes a very sympathetic missing person you know, what he was doing with his life and, you know, really good guy didn't have, you know, maybe some of the other issues that other missing persons have that we've covered on this program. Of course, we don't care, but the public does. Unfortunately, a lot of the public does. Um, so when they hear, a, a, you know, about a kid who is doing well in school and was popular at this radio station, that may catch people's attention more than uh, a woman who's a prostitute who has a drug addiction. It just does. It's not right. I don't like it. We're doing everything we can to change that. But that's where we are right now. So, um, so there's so there's that. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Who answered? Who asked that, Karen? I. I uh, Karen, uh, I think that what builds interest in missing persons cases, Karen, is covering them right the right way, presenting the facts to the public, and making them understand that they can change somebody's life by getting involved if they want to. That's I I think that there has to be that connection. It's just not sitting back. This isn't a movie where you watch it. And you leave and you say, well, that was funny or that was interesting or that was sad. And you just go on. That was, that was my entertainment for not tonight. Thank you. You know, we're trying to do uh, a little bit more than that here. Um, Michelle says, by looks, I'm also including social status. We all form opinions of people within seconds. I think that comes into play, just like you were saying. Uh, the Doe Patrol, Brandon Lawson, was because they made us believe in a person who was not that person. He had kids and a living girlfriend, so we had an empathy. Well, once again, Doe Patrol, I, I'm not just not going to get too deep into it um, because I don't know if I'm qualified to do that. Uh, people should not be judgmental. Uh, I Well, there's nothing wrong with judging people, Christine. I mean, we judge people all the time. We make a decision. I don't want to be around that person because that person's a criminal. I don't want to be around that person because that person's annoying. We're, that's a judgment that we're making. So there's nothing wrong with uh, judging people. That's what we do. That's how we stay out of trouble. That's how we keep good friends. And we, you know, we have good people who are good people who are friends and we keep bad people away. We're making those judgments. But what I'm, but what we're talking about here is equality. If you could say it in the law. All these people should be equal according to the law. And the law, police uh, departments, law enforcement should be looking at these people equally. So the public should be looking at them equally. Um, I mean, for mistakes, no one's perfect. Surely no one is perfect, Christine. That's right. 
Let me answer some questions that I got uh, before the show started tonight. We're already 50 minutes in, man. This is going to be a long show. Um, Elena, E-L-E-N-A, Elena, Elena, oh, Elena, maybe Elena, uh, asked me about a uh, TV show. You know, I touched upon this a little bit in the Q&A episode a couple weeks ago. She brought up in her long, the long form of the questions, Elena asked me about Up and Vanished and how it has a TV show and everything now. And, you know, wouldn't Unfound be more popular, something like that with a TV show. Uh, I've talked to several TV producers over the past few years, and there's just nothing has ever happened yet. Um, there's a variety of reasons why I think that is. <laughs> part of it's me, and part of it's them. Um, for them, what they're looking, generally, even though Up and Vanished, I, and I don't even know how popular that TV show is. I know I've been told I by the listeners, maybe some of you, that there have been a lot of mistakes in the TV show and they got several things wrong. I know, especially in the Jody Husentrude episode, from what I've been told, um, I don't know what kind of ratings it gets. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But the, you know, the TV producers that I've talked to, you know, they always want, you know, everything wrapped up in, in a nice bow at the end. And we know that these missing persons cases, when we get to them and unfound. They're not done yet. They're very, very wide open. There are no bows, none. Some of them now have been completed. Zoe Campos and, and you know, and I, I guess to, uh, you know, a certain extent, some of the other ones, although not completely, maybe Crystal Morrison's completely as well. But TV producers are generally looking for uh, something where people, when they're done watching it after an hour, they go away satisfied whereas if you're coming missing missing covering missing persons cases that aren't solved yet that's not possible now i've of course told them well, what about disappeared it's been going for like nine years now and they continue to churn out episodes of that it must be doing well or they wouldn't keep making the show and they just um they are not phased by my argument there to be honest the, but that's them. That's that's usually what I run into when I start talking to TV producers. They want something that I'm not sure Unfound can provide. Uh, but I, I think they're wrong. They think they're right. I don't know what you can do about that. Um, but as far as mine, you know, I also have to say that I'm not <laughs> I'm not the easiest guy to work with either. Um, because to quote Jack Black from one of my favorite movies of all time, School of Rock, I have vision up the butt. And, uh, you know, so, you know, so what he says in the movie, don't try to pull a power play on me. This is how I kind of feel with this. There's a certain vision that I have for a TV show. And if it's not that, then I'm just not interested. I'm just not interested. I, I'm not one of these podcasters who's out there who's only doing this. To get to that, you know, I'm not one of those people. Um, and But the thing is, those people who are like that, they're willing to compromise everything just to get on TV. They're willing to sell out this. They're willing to sell out that. They're willing to do this. Oh, yeah, that's great. This really, and, and that is how you end up getting a TV show like Up and Vanished. And this is not uh, a criticism of... I forgot his name right now. I hate it. The guy who uh, started up and vanished, Payne Lindsay. There you go. That's not his fault. You have to understand something. It's his. It's the name of his podcast on the TV show, but I really don't know how much control he has of it. So if you've seen mistakes in it or things were wrong or whatever, probably not his fault. Not his fault. Because you have people and their TV and they want to do things a certain way and they have to get it done in 44 minutes and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And that's why I've always had a criticism of disappeared as much as good as it is for getting disappearances out there. On the other hand, having covered some of those missing persons cases that have been on the TV show, I realize how many mistakes they make. 
And I know that if I did a TV show that people came away thinking everything was right and then it ended up being mistakes in it, I would feel like crap. So, and I also know going back to what I said about pain is that, you know, you do something like that and a lot of the stuff, the decisions and everything are totally, would be totally out of my hands. And not because I'm a control freak, but that would bother me. And I've been, in, I've been involved in TV production. I've done film production, probably, you know, more than any other true crime podcaster out there. And it's a, colla- it's a group effort. And because of that, things happen that you sometimes don't want to happen. So, um, so I'm, I, I guess in answering Elena's question, if she's, I don't know if she's in here, but uh, maybe she's going to watch this ev- uh, eventually, that um, I'm open to it, but I'm only open, it, open to doing it my way. Why? Because it's, it's going to be, my name is it a producer, it's going to be Unfound's name, on the program and people are going to come to it with certain expectations. And if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it's not going to reflect badly on the producers and all these other people who are, uh, you know, a year from now are going to be doing something totally different. It's going to reflect on me and the podcast that I'm still don't doing. So that's what I worry about. That's what I worry about. I worry about other people um, being able to shape the, the public's impression of what we do here. And there's only one person I want shaping the public's impression of what we do here, and that's me with the help of my assistants. Because in the end, it's, you know, it's my butt on the line being that I started this, whereas they're just doing it as a job. You know, a TV producer, they're going to go off and do something else. What do they care if mistakes are made? They got the thing done. They got it in the can. It played on TV and they're off to do something else. And, you know, whereas I'm still going to be here doing this podcast and then I have to deal with all the fallout if things uh, aren't done the right way and if there are mistakes and everything. And I'm not just not willing to do that. So in these in these talks with TV producers, I'm sure they've come away. Um thinking, man, that Ed Denzel, he's really a prick. It's just, that's just the way it has to be. But uh, it's not like I'm demanding anything. I, I'm, I, I get it. When they say, well, I don't know if they, I get it. You know, I'm not going to argue with them. I just tell them this is the way it has to be. And if we can't do it that way, I'm just not interested. Uh, I'm not offended that you, you know, don't agree with me. I get why you don't agree with me. But this is the only way I would do it. Um, so Elena, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, I do have her email, Sheree. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, Donna says Unsolved Mysteries was really popular. It was. It was, Donna. Um, it was. Uh, I think that Robert Stack had a lot to do with it. I don't know if it ever reached its popularity uh, later when Dennis Farina was on there. Um, it seemed like its heyday was in the 1980s, and things have just changed since then as well. Uh, thank you, Doe Patrol, for those um, nice words. Thank you. So, Elena, I hope that answers your question. I have no, I have no problem with these other podcasters. You know, If they have the opportunity to do it, and it makes sense for them, they're going to do it. And, uh, but my impression is they, they are very energetic about doing it. I'm just not that energetic about doing it. I'll do it. If somebody were to agree with my vision and I saw that they weren't just lying to me and everything, then I'm in 100%. And then I would be energetic. Otherwise, I just wouldn't be that stoked about it. Um... Another great question. Uh, I told you we were going to do some more statistics before the show was over. I already talked about the last names. How we've done, you know, three episodes with the last name Nichols, but no last, no episodes with the last name Smith. Um, Frank asked me. Uh, this is a question from Facebook. 
uh, about the average age of unfound disappearances. Uh, let me let me read this so I make sure that I get it 100% uh, correct here. Uh, no, no. Hold on a second. Uh, Frank asked me, do you think... Why does it keep doing that? Why does it do that? Do you think you cover more cases that are over 20 years old prior to 2000? I feel like the majority are, but I might be wrong. I'm mostly intrigued by disappearances that have to after, after the year 2000, but it might have to do with my age and relating to the case. And of course, they are all equally important. We were just talking about that. So this is a good question. Thank you, Frank. Um, well, Frank, if you are watching or you're going to watch this, I'm guessing you are going to watch this eventually if you aren't watching right now. I actually did the cal calculations just for you tonight before we started the show. I haven't done this in a while, so it was eye-opening to me. Um, we've, we've done 166 disappearances so far. That includes the Jolene Matthews uh, one I interviewed Steve Pankey. I included that in the numbers. 166. Uh, that does not include, um, you know, some of the interviews that I did with like Caroline Lowe or, uh, you know, some other some of these other interviews like the the dead, uh, the nobody guy, Tad Tobias, those episodes uh, where we don't talk about a specific disappearance, uh, they don't count. Just counting missing persons episodes uh, we have done 166 disappearances. Fridays will be 167. Um, I went through and calculated the age. The average age of a disappearance covered on and found is 17 years old. Now, that comes with some caveats. You have to remember, when the program started in 2016, of course, uh, a case that started, uh, you know, that happened in 2000 would only have been 16 years old. Well, now it's 20 years old. So we have to figure that into there. I did not recalculate like for when the, the show started. We also have to remember that some of the disappearances that we've covered on Unfound happened after the show got started. So Unfound is three and a half years old, but we've covered a few disappearances that are only two years old. In fact, I think with one was it wasn't Shanna Boydo. Which one was it? It was one we covered it right after it became uh, a year old. Which one was that? That was uh, no, it wasn't that one. Not Desiree Ferris. It was Jessica Hamby. We covered it. Just days after, and we and anybody that's been following uh, the program knows we have a year rule. Disappearance has to be a year old before we cover the disappearance. There are reasons for doing that that I'm not going to get into tonight. Um, so we covered that one right. Her her disappearance right after uh, the year mark. So so we have these really young cases that were even happened after. Unfound got started. And then we have some really old ones. We go back to, of course, um, uh, Evelyn Hartley from 1952, for example. I mean, that's 53, 52, 50, you know, 60 some years ago. And of course, much, much, you know, more recently, we had Mary, Van, Mary Jane Van Gilder from 1945, 75 years old. So we have these ones that are just a couple years old. And then we have a few that are really, really old, and we have a few in the 60s. So they kind of skew things both ways. The old ones skew it one way. The newer ones, a lot of newer ones, a lot of two-year, like 2018, 2017, 2016, skew it one way. If we were to take out any disappearance that was older than 50 years old, so older, you know, just, you know, anything before 1970. And then, and we'd throw out any that were newer than 2015, let's say, or any that happened after Unfound gets got started. 
would be right around that 20-year mark. I think it would skew. It would get the cases average would get a little older going toward that 20-year mark that I always use when talking to people. But as it sits now, just taking every case as it sits uh, in 2020, uh, the average age is 17 years old. So your average age of a disappearance right now would be one that happened in 2003. Now, of course, depending on what happens between now and this time next year, it may be, it still may be 17 years old, but that would mean then that the average year was 2004. So I hope you understand what I'm saying there. You should also know this. We have covered a total of 2,841 years of disappearances. So if you were to add up all of the years that these people have been missing, so somebody that disappeared in 2016, of course, that would be four years. You add up somebody that disappeared in 2002, that would be 18 years. Tom Brown disappeared in 2016, four years. We add up all those years together for the 18, the two, you add them all up. We have covered 2,841 years of disappearances. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, and, I, and I realized, for example, um, the Vanished uh, podcast that uh, came out coincidentally the same year, 2016, but at the beginning of 2016, uh, we didn't start here until September of 2016. Uh, Marissa, I think, still has covered. I know that she only she goes like three weeks and takes off one or something like that. She probably still has covered more disappearances overall, being that Unfound got started later. But she tends to cover a lot newer disappearances, like really new ones, like six months, four months old, eight months old. And I think probably because of that, she may have us in the the amount of disappears disappearances covered, but we surely have uh, we surely have more years total covered. Not that we're competing. Just as an example, it just shows you how, depending on the kinds of disappearances you want to cover and feature and who you get in touch touch with, it really can you know, move your stats one way or the other. In Marissa's case, covering a lot of new cases, I wouldn't be surprised if the average age of a disappearance she covers is maybe only 10 years, eight years old. Whereas because we have that stipulation that a case has to be a year old, and uh, frankly, my, you know, I, I like covering those older disappearances. And I think Emily knows that. Um, I think that's probably why the disappearance, the average age of a disappearance on this program, even though we're doing the same thing as the vanished is, are probably the average age of a case on Unfound is greatly older. And I think that comes down to how Marissa handles her program and how uh, I handle uh, mine. So interesting statistics. I had not uh, totaled them up in a while, but I'm glad I did. And Frank, thank you for uh, asking me that very interesting question. It, it caused me to kind of do a calculation that I haven't done in a while, and now I know. Let's take another question, and then we will move on. This actually came from one of my assistants, Natasha, who I've talked about with the YouTube uh, channel and with the website. Uh, do I think that because of COVID, people staying at home uh, as much, th there are going to be a lot more crimes of opportunity? And she, I think she gave the example, maybe somebody, an older person who's at home, somebody might try to make it look like the person died of, a, died of the, the virus when really the person died some other way or was suffocated or, or maybe I'm, I'm using that word or something like that. Um, I really don't think so. Uh, but I, I think it just depends. I have read several stories, uh, since everybody started locking down at, over the like two weeks or three weeks, which whatever it's been. And from what I've read, crime is really, really down overall, way, way, way down. However, on the other hand, I saw that in Jacksonville, they're still having the same Jacksonville, Florida. They're still having the same level of violent crime there. So, you know, I, I don't know what to think. I think that uh, COVID-19 and the social distancing and self-isolating and people staying at home, it's certainly having 
uh, a positive effect, positive effect on the crime rate in the United States. There, there, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Now, we know the reasons that are happening because nobody's out there. It's more obvious uh, that maybe criminals are driving in streets and walking the streets because the law-abiding citizens aren't. So that may have something to do with it. Uh, surely has a, a mostly to do with it. But as far as um, crimes of opportunity, maybe, uh, you know, um, you know, we hear these stories about nurses who aren't caught until years later that they were actually killing some of their patients. They had these old people who were, uh, you know, had life threatening issues already, but we hear about these nurses who were actually killing them, uh, and then they weren't found out till years and years later. Maybe there's some of that. I mean, certainly something like a virus like this would certainly be able to cover up uh, a nurse or a doctor who was doing something like that. Surely it would. For sure, for sure. Um, so that – I wouldn't doubt that that's going on. I mean, that a lot of, we have a lot of medical professionals, professionals out there. And there probably are a couple nasty ones still working out there. I don't think they've all gotten weeded out. So it very well may be that the that older people suffering from this virus in the hospital, not sure if they're going to recover or not. And then there's some underhanded nurse who has this fetish for seeing people die. Um, certainly possible. I would say that's more possible than anything else as far as crimes of opportunity. Uh, I think that with so many people being at home, I'm guessing break-ins and robberies, burglaries are way down being that so many people are now living it, you know, staying at home. There's somebody always at home now, at least for a lot of people. Of course, there's still people that still have their same schedules uh, for their work. Their, their work hasn't been affected or not, but other people in other professions uh, they've been greatly, greatly affected, unfortunately. Um, so Natasha, assistant Natasha, I hope that answers your question. Um, Paula asks me, if someone went missing and their family reached out to you early on, like days after, and offered to pay your expenses and for your time, would you go to them and help them with law enforcement search? Um, probably not, Paul. Probably not. Uh, I don't charge families anything ever. So there's that. And, uh, I'm not, you know, I'll talk to anybody. And in fact, I can't tell you who this is, but there is a disappearance that turned to a murder it was a disappearance, I'm guessing, for about a year. And then the remains were found, and it is presumed to be a murder. And this family ended up tracking me down and finding me. They knew about me somehow and wanted to talk to me about you know, what they could do. Even if though it was now a, a murder and the remains were found, it was not a disappearance anymore. It, it was a murder. And even in that case... I talked to the people and 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 gave um, I think it was the mother uh, some free advice, and I've talked to them a couple times. Um, I think that me going there, Paula, and everything, I just I don't know. I, I think that that would just you know the family in those early days and weeks and months needs to be working with law enforcement, getting their message across. Um, that's where their, uh, attentions need to be not giving me money and having me come in and everything, uh, to do that. Uh, I think that, uh, unfound, as I've said before, it's really a cold case program. It's not a hot case program. It's a cold case program. And, uh, the family is best off dealing with local officials, local media, et cetera. That doesn't work after after a year. 
then you know we're all all in here to try to look at it from a different angle. Look at it now that a year has passed and what has transpired and everything else. Because I think that's after doing 166 cases, that's where my expertise lies and that's where the assistant's expertise is lie. So uh, that's my answer to that. Um, all right. Elizabeth's getting out of here. Okay. Hi, Ed. Um, hope you're all doing well. Say, I don't know if you're just tuning in now, Elizabeth, whether you're coming or going. Hello. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Paul. Um, we're always willing to help. Always. But, you know, getting on the ground there and, you know, I, I – <laughs> Uh, law enforcement, even when it comes within the context of this program, doesn't want to tell me anything except for uh, the Van Gilder disappearance. So me being there, you know, law enforcement isn't going to look at me and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we have to we have to talk to this guy. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. Um, hello. All right. Just been working today. OK, Elizabeth. Well, we're still going and we got a little more to go. Um, what have I not yet talked about? Remains found outside of Lubbock, Texas, uh, just recently. Uh, we have covered two disappearances in Lubbock. Uh, one is solved, Zoe Campos. Of course, the other one that is not solved is Jennifer Wilkerson. Not sure what to make right at this time. Not a lot of details. I know that Jennifer's mother uh, has commented on the, the post that I saw on Facebook. Um, just not sure what to make of it. Uh, I will tell you that it was not actually in Lubbock County. It was the county near Lubbock and, um, Hockley, I think County. I think so. Maybe not. Um, just not sure. I looked up on NamUs to see if there are how many disappearances there were in that County. And there were a few in this other County where the remains were found, but it's very near Lubbock. So I don't, I don't know what's going to – I'll tell you this. I will be surprised if it's uh, Jennifer Wilkerson. I'll be very, very surprised if it is, um, given what uh, I think I know about that disappearance. And I'm also going to guess that it's a disappearance. Uh, whoever has found probably this is a, a man or woman who went missing recently. So I, I think you're going to probably have to rule out any disappearances that happened that are any older than, you know, a couple years old. That's what I'm thinking right at the second. Once again, from the very short article that has come out about it, uh, that's all I'm, you know, really willing to say at this point. But anytime remains pop up, you know, near where a disappearance, where a disappearance that we covered, you know, happened. Um, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago with remains being found up in Southern Alabama near the panhandle of Florida, I talked about that. We're going to talk about it, but, uh, I would be uh, very surprised if the remains are of Jennifer Wilkerson. Um, Paula says, I've been looking at the address. It's an abandoned home, one County over. Thank you, Paula, for that. That would lead me even more to believe, Paula, that it was probably, you know, some squatter or uh, a drug addict or someone, a um, homeless person using it uh, as shelter. That's, you know, that's because nobody, if, if, if it's a murder, nobody's going to hide a body in an abandoned house because they know eventually somebody's going to come by there. So I'm, I'm going to guess that it's probably an overdose or exposure or something like that. Now that you've told me that, thank you for that, Paula. Um, let's move on here. Uh, I do need to talk about this, and Cherie let me know about this shortly before the program started, so I can't talk about it in detail because I've not seen it yet. But Phil Klein, private investor Phil Klein, he is still working on Tom Brown's disappearance. I guess he did a Facebook Live today. I don't know how many of you caught it. Uh, once again, I did not see it. But what Cherie told me about it is uh, the following points. Cherie, feel free if you want to add anything in here. Um, Phil Klein says that he is uh, looking at 
they're looking at multi. He says he's getting along with the new sheriff. He made the point of uh, mentioning that. He says he's really a West Texas sheriff, whatever that means. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but multiple murder suspects is what Phil Klein said on this live show. They are in the process of trying to figure out who planted the cell phone, uh, not to go through all the permutations of that, but um, they had this search not long after Tom, you know, disappeared. And within five minutes, they found a phone. Um, and it seemed to be everybody was a little surprised about it. The most surprising part was that it did not look like it had been out in the elements at all, even though if it is Tom's or was Tom's, it had to have been out there since the night that he disappeared, November 2016. And this phone was found, I'm sure somebody's going to correct me on this, but in December, January, and it had rained and everything else, and it looked pristine. And people were very suspicious about that. So a lot of people uh, believe it was planted. In fact, I believe the, uh, you know, the attorney general's office, one of their representatives just outright came out and said that as well, or somebody in the Texas Rangers just came out and just said, yeah, you know, they, they were very suspicious about the phone. So there's that. And Phil Klein says that he's also putting uh, something to, together so it can be brought to a grand jury. Um, okay. I, I don't know what to say. Like I said, I found out about this. Cherie told me about this about 15 minutes before uh, this show started. I didn't know there was going to be uh, a Facebook Live. I don't keep tabs on what Phil Klein is doing at all. I, I I don't even know if I follow his page on Facebook for any of that. I, I don't know. But um, this is what he's saying. Uh, for all of you out there who believe that Tom was murdered, uh, this seems like this is the direction that it's going. Uh, multiple murder suspects. Likes the new sheriff. Uh, the phone is planted, and, and you know. And I have to say, if anything would make you believe that this was a murder and not Tom committing suicide or dying from exposure, it would be that the phone is planted. I mean, if that can be proven, then I mean that raises the odds greatly that it was a murder for sure. And then he's talking about a grand jury, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, almost an hour and a half in, I think I just have to mention uh, one more thing before we get to this Friday's episode. Uh, did you hear this? Did you read this thing about Magellan TV? Some of you might want to look into this. They're going to offer a thousand dollars to people to watch 24 hours straight of true crime documentaries in TV. And rate the documentaries and, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, etc. The key is it's 24 hours straight. So you'd have to stay up for 24 hours in a row. And I don't know if it's some contest or something, but they are going to be paying people $1,000 each to do this. I don't, like I said, I don't know if this is a contest where... I don't know if it's going to be like multiple people. So they're going to be giving up thousand dollars per person. I mean, you get 20 people, that's $20,000 right there. I don't know, but Magellan TV, you can look it up, Google it. Have to watch 24 hours of crew crime, true crime TV, get paid a thousand dollars to do it. And it says it's 16 documentaries. So I'm guessing a couple of these documentaries are a couple hours long. Uh, I think they in I don't I read the article I didn't write it down I think it might have even listed some of the documentaries and topics that that people would be watching so uh, um, so maybe some of you want to look into that uh, of course I know many people out there have lost their jobs and these stimulus checks and everything you know thousand dollars for twenty four hours work that's not too bad if you can stay awake that long. If you can stay awake, I'm guessing that if you fall asleep, then uh, you don't get the money. I'm guessing. Just caught my eye. So there you go. Uh, Angela, have you ever thought of developing, developing a written protocol for families that have a missing person, like things they should do to make sure law enforcement does what they should do, like check 
for video. Um, I have it up in my head, Angela. You know, the tough part about it is no family ever thinks that uh, they're going to have a missing person in the, you know, in their in their family. So it it's a lot different compared to if you live in Japan and earthquakes happen. You have an earthquake protocol because you expect sooner or later an earthquake is going to happen. Um, or if you live in Florida, we have a hurricane protocol and everything because hurricanes do hit Florida because we know sooner or later it's going to happen. Whereas missing persons, I can tell them, you know, but nobody ever beforehand, but nobody ever thinks that's going to happen to them. And after it happens, then, it, you know, it's, it's kind of already too late uh, for, you know, developing, you know, the, you know, and that's why, you know, to have a step-by-step -step protocol, here's what I say. If anybody, any family is watching or listening out there, number one thing you do, as soon as you find out that a loved one is missing, is you write down all the people who might have wanted that person to disappear. That is the first thing you do. Why? And you Because from that... You can give that to the police and they can check on these people's alibis quickly. Because once a week passes, pa a week pass passes, um, then everything starts to get very muddled. That is the first thing. Everything else, filing a report, you know, checking for phone records and all those things, they should be done all obviously timely. But you have to do that first. Because if this is a walk away or somebody just left their life or something that's – then even though it's horrible, no crime has been committed. But it doesn't hurt to be cynical, to be suspicious when a loved one goes missing. Just start writing names down and give it to the police. Well, these are the people – if this is something happened and this is the murder, these are the people who you should look at. Could you please get alibis for these people? Thank you. That's my number one. Uh, and then if you can rule all those people out, then it, it probably means that this is not a murder. This is something else. That's what I would say. Uh, thank you for that, Cherie. Yes, Instagram. Um, that's not healthy. 24 hours. Uh, Paula says, I guess it's like, net, net, like Netflix. So it asks, are you still watching? Uh, maybe. I guess so, Paula. Um. Concha says judgment would be skewed due to from a lack of sleep. And Michelle says, I got coffee. Sounds like we have some people here that may be thinking about doing this. Um, okay. And thank you for agreeing with me, Michelle. And one more thing. Uh, I keep saying this one more thing. Um, we should know that, and, and this is kind of important to me, but yesterday was Michelle McNamara's 50th birthday. birthday. Uh, we're, uh, wife of the comedian Patton Oswalt, who uh, voiced the rat in Ratatouille. Uh, she died uh, a couple years ago. She, um, you know, back in the day, had a really great website, True Crime Diary, where she wrote about different disappearances and unsolved murders, and I can remember reading it years ago. And... She was also the kind of the person that kind of brought the original Night Stalker, uh, serial killer, uh, back to life, and her interest in it and pursuing it like she did. And I, I, she was one of those people that I believe was going about things the right way. And I actually had an email back and forth with her several years ago, maybe two thousand. 14, maybe something like that, 2013, 2012, about the original Night Stalker. This is going year, years now. Um, of course, she died very suddenly. Uh, I guess she had some heart ailment that nobody knew about. She died in her sleep. And she would have turned 50 yesterday. So I saw that. And just seeing the name uh, really brings back uh, a lot of memories for me. Um, I guess from the years, like I said, 2011, 2012, 2013, after I moved here to Florida and I was very interested in the original Night Stalker, was reading a lot about it and, and everything. And um, 
I always thought she did good work, and it, it's it's very uh, sad that uh, she died way too young, and unfortunately, she also died before the original Night Stalker was caught. So I um, caught my eye, and I just wanted to mention it. Let's move on to this Friday's disappearance. The disappearance of Christopher Lynn Sanders from Monahans, Texas, on August 13th, 2017. So that's definitely going to start uh, skewing the average of Unfound's case a little to a little newer by at least a, a couple months. Um, this is an episode I'm calling Over the Fence, and I'll explain that in a second. The guest will be his mother, Sandy Sanders. Yes, that's her name, Sandy Sanders. We had to, we had to talk about that. I love it. Sandy Sanders. Uh, this is an interview that I did on Monday. Went real well. Uh, uh, this episode is going to be over two hours long. And I need to point out right now is maybe some of you are going to be looking him up now. You're going to run across another Christopher Lynn Sanders from Texas. And you're going to see an obituary from November of last year. That is not this Christopher Lynn Sanders. This Christopher Lynn Sanders was born in 1977. Uh, that Christopher Lynn Sanders was born in 1970. It's, it's Texas, but a different part of Texas. And that Christopher Lynn Sanders is not the, the guy who is missing. And most importantly, uh, Christopher Lynn Sanders, uh, his disappearance we're covering this Friday – He's not been declared deceased, whereas the other guy has an obituary and there was a funeral home involved and everything else. Totally different person. Uh, this is a uh, – maybe you've already noticed this as well. Uh, this is a disappearance that lends itself to making some maps, and I also did a video. The video is now up on the YouTube channel uh, as, as I speak. I did it earlier today, so you might want to check that out. And I also uh, posted some pictures on Instagram in the Facebook group and uh, on the Unfound page on Facebook. So some of you or anybody that can access uh, them can look at some of the pictures. The general facts are that he was working in Monahans, Texas. He had been working there for an oil drilling company over the course of the summer of 2017. He'd actually bought a trailer. So he could live there, and there was a, I'm going to quote unquote, quote, RV park there where all these oil drilling employees were living. They each had their own RV or trailer, and they were living on this lot. And what happened on this Sunday morning is that Chris, uh, the guy who was in the trailer right next to him saw Chris come out of his trailer, went to his truck, went back to his trailer, back and forth a couple times. Not carrying anything, just going back and forth for whatever reason. He looked a little agitated. And then Chris just walked off. And he, uh, the way this guy who saw it explains it, uh, Chris like sl tried to slam the door of his truck shut. And he slammed it so hard that the door like bounced back open. And because of that, the, the truck alarm, car alarm, whatever you want to call it, started going off. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And Chris just kept walking. He went, to, he walked to the, the edge of this RV park, climbed over the fence, walked across the frontage road, that, and then out onto Interstate 20, which runs right by, uh, which runs right through Monahans, Texas. And uh, this RV park was right up against the interstate. Walked over the, jumped over the fence to the uh, I-20 and started walking east. This guy says he watched Chris walk as far as he could. He went up over, uh, there was like an exit there. He went over on the highway, but kind of the highway went up and then over, over like over the other side. This guy said he watched him just vanish over that hill. Chris was never seen again. That happened about 9.30 in the morning. Two hours and 20 minutes later, his cousin, Chris's cousin, who also lived in the RV park, called him wondering where he was. Chris picked up the phone two hours and 20 minutes later. He said he was clearing his head. He was going, for, he was walking, he was clearing his head. And that's all he said he was doing and hung up the phone. When this cousin tried to call him back, 
the phone was shut off. And nobody heard. So the last person to see Chris was this guy who saw him walk out into the highway going away. And then the last person to talk to him was his cousin. And there are phone records that this call happened. So it's, it's one of those cases. person just walks off. Broad daylight on a Sunday in Texas on an interstate. And somehow this person has not been found two and a half years later. Uh, there are some mitigating factors in this. Uh, he was having problems with his wife, having money. Pro he was sending her money to pay taxes on their property, and instead she was taking the money and giving it to her son who was in jail. Chris was talking about getting a divorce from this woman. And there are records that show that his wife, who uh, where they lived was actually seven miles away, Seven hours away, not seven miles, seven hours away in Case in Texas, where uh, his wife Angela was supposed to be living. There are records show that she was in the Monahans area the day before the disappearance and the day after the disappearance, but no records of her being in Monahans on the day of the disappearance. Should know some other things. Uh, Chris was a recovering addict. Uh, he had been a, a drug addict for several years, finally kicked it in about 2009. And he had been diagnosed as being bipolar a couple years before he disappeared. However, he was on medication. That medication was found in his trailer when they finally got inside it. And that's the other thing. Even though he left the door of his truck open with the alarm blaring, his trailer was locked. Nothing unusual in the trailer, nothing missing. The TV was on, the AC was on. And Chris, uh, other than his cousin calling him, he made, did not make or receive any calls or texts that Sunday other than that call. So that is the disappearance for this Sunday. I should say this is uh, a disappearance that I think that the family uh, and friends of the family have been doing a very good job publicizing it. Even before uh, Emily first talked to Sandy for the first time, I knew about this disappearance having seen it posted several different places. And so it was finally nice to meet Sandy and to talk to her. And she did a great job with the interview. So that is this Friday's disappearance. Christopher Lynn Sanders, Monahans, Texas, August 13th, 2017. An episode I'm calling Over the Fence. The guest is his mother, Sandy Sanders. And I once again remind you, there is a video here on YouTube that you can watch uh, regarding it, a diagram I did of the area. And also some pictures that I posted on Facebook and Instagram. So that's it. Wow. Uh, did a little intro, listening to a little disco music these days. Uh, the Christy Nichols poll. Um, talked about the t-shirts, how we're trying to all make that. Uh, Going to try to get that all figured out um, with uh, Heather now doing the t-shirts. YouTube monetization. Remains found in Lubbock, near Lubbock, Texas. Nebraska disappearances, Christy Nichols, Regina Marie Boss, Kamisha Hollis, Jason Jolkowski, Jeff Nichols, going to be a search happening uh, soon in the Salt Lake City area. All of the people with the last name Nichols uh, that we featured and all these other last names where we haven't, these popular last names, we haven't featured anyone with those last names yet. Talked about Phil Klein doing a Facebook Live today, Magellan TV, Michelle McNamara, and once again, Chris Sanders is Friday's episode and took a lot of great questions from all of you. So that's it. That's a long live show right there. Uh, an hour and 40 minutes. I'll leave you with that. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Thank you so much. Hope you didn't, uh, enjoyed it. I love doing these shows on Wednesday nights. And please stay safe out there. Don't let this stuff get you down. There are better days ahead, I promise. Good night.